Section 13 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 13, The Campaign of 1844. In the letter to Stuart, which we have quoted, Lincoln announced his intention to form a partnership with Judge Logan, which was soon carried out. His connection with Stuart was formally dissolved in April 1841, and one with Logan formed, which continued for four years. It may almost be said that Lincoln's practice as a lawyer begins from this time. Stuart, though even then giving promise of the distinction at which he arrived in his profession later in life, was at that period so entirely devoted to politics that the business of the office was altogether a secondary matter to him, and Lincoln, although no longer in his first youth, being then thirty-two years of age, had not yet formed those habits of close application which are indispensable to permanent success at the bar. He was not behind the greater part of his contemporaries in this respect. Among all the lawyers of the circuit who were then, or who afterwards became eminent practitioners, footnote, they were Dan Stone, Jesse B. Thomas, Cyrus Walker, Schuyler Strong, Albert T. Bledsoe, George Forquer, Samuel H. Treat, Ninian W. Edwards, Josiah Lamborn, John J. Hardin, Edward D. Baker, and others. There were few indeed who in those days applied themselves with any degree of persistency to the close study of legal principles. One of these few was Stephen T. Logan. He was more or less a politician, as were all his compeers at the bar, but he was always more a lawyer than anything else. He had that love for his profession which it jealously exacts as a condition of succeeding. He possessed few books, and it used to be said of him long afterwards that he carried his library in his hat. But the books which he had he never ceased to read and to ponder, and we heard him say when he was sixty years old that once every year since he came of age he had read Blackstone's commentaries through. He had that old-fashioned lawyer-like morality which was keenly intolerant of any laxity or slovenliness of mind or character. His former partner had been Edward D. Baker, but this brilliant and mercurial spirit was not congenial to Logan. Baker's carelessness in money matters was intolerable to him, and he was glad to escape from an associate so gifted and so exasperating. Footnote. Logan's office was, in fact, a nursery of statesmen. Three of his partners, William L. May, Baker, and Lincoln, left him in rapid succession to go to Congress, and finally the contagion gained the head of the firm, and the judge was himself the candidate of his party when it was no longer able to elect one. After he had retired from practice, the office, under his son-in-law and successor, Milton Hay, retained its prestige for cradling public men. John M. Palmer and Shelby M. Cullum left it to be governors of the state, and the latter to be a congressman and senator. Needing someone, however, to assist him in his practice, which was then considerable, he invited Lincoln into partnership. He had, as we have seen, formed a favorable opinion of the young Kentuckian the first time they had met. In his subsequent acquaintance with him, he had come to recognize and respect his abilities, his unpretending common sense, and his innate integrity. The partnership continued about four years, but the benefit Lincoln derived from it lasted all his life. The example of Judge Logan's thrift, order, and severity of morals, his straightforward devotion to his profession, his close and careful study of his cases, together with the larger and more important range of practice to which Lincoln was introduced by this new association, confirmed all those salutary tendencies by which he had been led into the profession, and corrected those less desirable ones which he shared with most of the lawyers about him. He began for the first time to study his cases with energy and patience, to resist the tendency almost universal at that day to supply with florid rhetoric the attorney's deficiency in law. In short, to educate, discipline, and train the enormous faculty, hitherto latent in him, for close and severe intellectual labor. Logan, who had expected that Lincoln's chief value to him would be as a talking advocate before juries, 
was surprised and pleased to find his new partner rapidly becoming a lawyer. He would study out his case and make about it as much of it as anybody, said Logan many years later. His ambition as a lawyer increased. He grew constantly. By close study of each case, as it came up, he got to be quite a formidable lawyer. The character of the man is in these words. He had vast concerns entrusted to him in the course of his life, and disposed of them one at a time as they were presented. At the end of four years, the partnership was dissolved. Judge Logan took his son, David, afterwards a well-known politician and lawyer of Oregon, into his office, and Lincoln opened one of his own, into which he soon invited a young, bright, and enthusiastic man named William Henry Herndon, who remained his partner as long as Lincoln lived. The old partners continued close and intimate friends. They practiced at the same bar for twenty years, often as associates, and often as adversaries, but always with relations of mutual confidence and regard. They had the unusual honor, while they were still comparatively young men, of seeing their names indissolubly associated in the map of their state as a memorial to future ages of their friendship and their fame in the county of Logan, in which the city of Lincoln is the county seat. They both prospered, each in his way. Logan rapidly gained a great reputation and accumulated an ample fortune. Lincoln, while he did not become rich, always earned a respectable livelihood, and never knew the care of poverty or debt from that time forward. His wife and he suited their style of living to their means, and were equally removed from luxury and privation. They went to live immediately after their marriage at a boarding house. Footnote. This house is still standing, opposite St. Paul's Church, called the Globe, which was, quote, very well kept by a widow lady of the name of Beck, unquote. And there their first child was born, who was one day to be Secretary of War and Minister to England, and for whom was reserved the strange experience of standing by the deathbed of two assassinated presidents. Lincoln afterwards built a comfortable house of wood on the corner of 8th and Jackson Streets, where he lived until he removed to the White House. Neither his marriage nor his new professional interest, however, put an end to his participation in politics. Even that period of gloom and depression of which we have spoken, and which has been so much exaggerated by the chroniclers and the gossip of Springfield, could not have interrupted for any length of time his activity as a member of the legislature. Only for a few days was he absent from his place in the House. On the 19th of January, 1841, John J. Hardin apologized for the delay in some committee business, alleging Mr. Lincoln's indisposition as an excuse. On the 23rd, the letter to Stuart was written, but on the 26th, Lincoln had so far recovered his self-possession as to resume his place in the House and the leadership of his party. The journals of the next month show his constant activity and prominence in the routine business of the legislature until it adjourned. In August, Stuart was re-elected to Congress. Lincoln made his visit to Kentucky with speed, and returned to find himself generally talked of for governor of the state. This idea did not commend itself to the judgment of himself or his friends, and accordingly we find in the Sangamo Journal, one of those semi-official announcements so much in vogue in early Western politics, which, while disclaiming any direct inspiration from Mr. Lincoln, expressed the gratitude of his friends for the movement in his favor, but declined the nomination. Quote, his talents and services endear him to the Whig party, but we do not believe he desires the nomination. He has already made great sacrifices in maintaining his party principles, and before his political friends ask him to make additional sacrifices, the subject should be well considered. The office of governor, which would of necessity interfere with the practice of his profession, would poorly compensate him for the loss of four of the best years of his life. End of quote. He served this year as a member of the Whig Central Committee, and bore a prominent part in the movement set on foot at that time to check intemperance in the use of spirits. It was a movement in the name and memory of Washington and the orators of the cause made effective rhetorical use of its august associations. A passage from the close of a speech made by Lincoln on February 22, 1842, shows the fervor and feeling of the hour. Quote, 
Washington is the mightiest name of earth, long since mightiest in the cause of civil liberty, still mightiest in moral reformation. On that name no eulogy is expected. It cannot be. To add brightness to the sun or glory to the name of Washington is alike impossible. Let none attempt it. In solemn awe pronounce the name, and in its naked, deathless splendor leave it shining on. End of quote. A mass meeting of the Whigs of the district was held at Springfield on the 1st of March, 1843, for the purpose of organizing the party for the elections of the year. On the occasion, Lincoln was the most prominent figure. He called the meeting to order, stated its object, and drew up the platform of principles which embraced the orthodox Whig tenants of a protective tariff, national bank, the distribution of the proceeds of the public lands, and finally the tardy conversion of the party to the convention system which had been forced upon them by the example of the Democrats, who had shown them that victory could not be organized without it. Lincoln was also chairman of the committee which was charged with the address to the people, and a paragraph from this document is worth quoting as showing the use which he made at that early day of a pregnant text which was hereafter to figure in a far more momentous connection and exercise a powerful influence upon his career. Exhorting the Whigs to harmony, he says, quote, That union is strength is a truth that has been known, illustrated, and declared in various ways and forms in all ages of the world. That great fabulist and philosopher, Aesop, illustrated it by his fable of the bundle of sticks, and he whose wisdom surpasses that of all philosophers has declared that a house divided against itself cannot stand. End of quote. He calls to mind the victory of 1840, the overwhelming majority gained by the Whigs that year, their ill success since, and the necessity of unity and concord that the party may make its entire strength felt. Lincoln was at this time a candidate for the Whig nomination to Congress, but he was confronted by formidable competition. The adjoining county of Morgan was warmly devoted to one of its own citizens, John J. Hardin a man of unusually gallant and chivalrous strain of character, and several other counties, for reasons not worth considering, were pledged to support any one whom Morgan County presented. If Lincoln had carried Sangamon County, his strength was so great in Menard and Mason, where he was personally known, that he could have been easily nominated. But Edward D. Baker had long coveted a seat in Congress, and went into the contest against Lincoln with many points in his favor. He was of about the same age, but had resided longer in the district, had a larger personal acquaintance, and was a much readier and more pleasing speaker. In fact, there were few men who have ever lived in this country with more of the peculiar temperament of the orator than Edward Dickinson Baker. It is related of him that on one occasion, when the circumstances called for a policy of reserve, he was urged by his friends to go out upon a balcony and address an impromptu audience which was calling for him. No, he replied, mistrusting his own fluency. If I go out there, I will make a better speech than I want to. He was hardly capable of the severe study and care by which great parliamentary speakers are trained, but before a popular audience, and on all occasions where brilliant and effective improvisation is called for, he was almost unequaled. His funeral oration over the dead body of Senator Broderick in California his thrilling and inspiring appeal in Union Square, New York, at the great meeting of April 1861, and his reply to Breckinridge in the Senate, delivered upon the impulse of the moment, conceived as he listened to the Kentuckian's peroration, leaning against the doorway of the chamber, in full uniform, booted and spurred, as he had ridden into Washington from the camp, are among the most remarkable specimens of absolutely unstudied and thrilling eloquence which our annals contain. He was also a man of extremely prepossessing appearance. Born in England, of poor yet educated parents, and brought as a child to this country, his good looks and brightness had early attracted the attention of prominent gentlemen in Illinois, especially of Governor Edwards, who had made much of him and assisted him to a good education. He had met with considerable success as a lawyer, though he always relied rather upon his eloquence than his law and there were few juries which could resist the force and fury of his speech 
and not many lawyers could keep their equanimity in the face of his witty persiflage and savage sarcasm. When to all this is added a genuine love of every species of combat, physical and moral, we may understand the name Charles Sumner, paraphrasing a well-known epigram, applied to him in the Senate after his heroic death at Ball's Bluff. The Prince Rupert of Battle and Debate If Baker had relied upon his own unquestionable merits, he would have been reasonably sure of succeeding in a community so well acquainted with him as Sangamon County. But to make assurance doubly sure, his friends resorted to tactics which Lincoln, the most magnanimous and placable of men, thought rather unfair. Baker and his wife belonged to that numerous and powerful sect which has several times played an important part in Western politics, the Disciples. They all supported him energetically, and used as arguments against Lincoln that his wife was a Presbyterian, that most of her family were Episcopalians, that Lincoln himself belonged to no church, and that he had been suspected of deism, and finally, that he was the candidate of the aristocracy. This last charge so amazed Lincoln that he was unable to frame any satisfactory answer to it. The memory of his flat-boating days, of his illiterate youth, even of his deerskin breeches, shrunken by rain and exposure, appeared to have no power against this unexpected and baleful charge. When the county convention met, the delegates to the district convention were instructed to cast the vote of Sangamon for Baker. It showed the confidence of the convention in the imperturbable good nature of the defeated candidate that they elected him a delegate to the congressional convention, charged with the cause of his successful rival. In a letter to Speed, he humorously refers to his situation as that of a rejected suitor who is asked to act as groomsman at the wedding of his sweetheart. It soon became evident that Baker could not get strength enough outside of the county to nominate him. Lincoln, in a letter to Speed, written in May, said, quote, In relation to our Congress matter here, you were right in supposing I would support the nominee. Neither Baker nor I, however, is the man, but Hardin, so far as I can judge from present appearances. We shall have no split or trouble about the matter. All will be harmony. End of quote. A few days later, this prediction was realized. The convention met at Pekin and nominated Hardin with all the customary symptoms of spontaneous enthusiasm. He was elected in August. Footnote. The opposing candidate was James A. McDougall, who was afterwards, as senator from California, one of the most remarkable and eccentric figures in Washington life. After a short but active canvass, in which Lincoln bore his part as usual, Hardin took his seat in December. The next year the time of holding elections was changed, and always afterwards the candidates were elected the year before vacancies were to occur. In May 1844, therefore, Baker attained the desire of his heart by being nominated, and in August he was elected, defeating John Calhoun, while Lincoln had the laborious and honorable post of presidential elector. It was not the first time nor the last time that he acted in this capacity, the place had become his by a sort of prescription. His persuasive and convincing oratory was thought so useful to his party that every four years he was sent, in the character of electoral canvasser, to the remotest regions of the state to talk to the people in their own dialect, with their own habits of thought and feeling, in favor of the Whig candidate. The office had its especial charm for him. If beaten, as generally happened, the defeat had no personal significance. If elected, the functions of the place were discharged in one day, and the office passed from existence. But there was something more than the orator and the partisan concerned in the campaign of 1844. The whole heart of the man was enlisted in it, for the candidate was the beloved and idolized leader of the Whigs, Henry Clay. It is probable that we shall never see again in this country another such instance of the personal devotion of a party to its chieftain as that which was shown by the long and wonderful career of Mr. Clay. He became prominent in the politics of Kentucky near the close of the last century, at twenty-three years of age. He was elected first to the Senate at twenty-nine. He died a senator at seventy-five, and for the greater part of that long interval he was the most considerable personal influence in American politics. As senator, 
representative, speaker of the house, and diplomatist, he filled the public eye for half a century, and although he twice peremptorily retired from office, and although he was the mark of the most furious partisan hatred all his days, neither his own weariness nor the malice of his enemies could ever keep him for any length of time from the commanding position for which his temperament and his nature designed him. He was beloved, respected, and served by his adherents with a single-hearted allegiance which seems impossible to the more complex life of a later generation. In 1844, it is true, he was no longer young, and his power may be said to have been on the decline, but there were circumstances connected with this his last candidacy which excited his faithful followers to a peculiar intensity of devotion. He had been, as many thought, unjustly passed over in 1840, and General Harrison, a man of greatly inferior capacity, had been preferred to him on the grounds of prudence and expediency. After three days of balloting had shown that the eloquent Kentuckian had more friends and more enemies than any other man in the Republic. He had seemed to regain all his popularity by the prompt and frank support which he gave to the candidacy of Harrison, and after the President's death and the treachery of Tyler had turned the victory of the Whigs into dust and ashes, the entire party came back to Clay with passionate affection and confidence to lead them in the desperate battle which perhaps no man could have won. The Whigs, however, were far from appreciating this. There is evident in all their utterances of the spring and early summer of 1844 an ardent and almost furious conviction not only of the necessity but the certainty of success. Mr. Clay was nominated long before the convention met in Baltimore. The convention of the 1st of May only ratified the popular will. No other name was mentioned. Mr. Watkins Lee had the honor of presenting his name. A word, he said, that expressed more enthusiasm, that had in it more eloquence than the names of Chatham, Burke, Patrick Henry, and, he continued, rising to the requirements of the occasion, to us more than any other and all other names together. Nothing was left to be said, and Clay was nominated without a ballot. Mr. Lumpkin of Georgia then nominated Theodore Frelinghausen for vice president, not hesitating to avow in the warmth and expansion of the hour that he believed that the baptismal name of the New Jersey gentleman had a mystical appropriateness to the occasion. In the Democratic Convention, Mr. Van Buren had a majority of delegates pledged to support him, but it had already been resolved in the inner councils of the party that he should be defeated. The Southern leaders had determined upon the immediate and unconditional annexation of Texas, and Mr. Van Buren's views upon this vital question were too moderate and conservative to suit the adventurous spirits who most closely surrounded President Tyler. During the whole of the preceding year, a steady and earnest propaganda of annexation had been on foot, starting from the immediate entourage of the President and embracing a large number of Southern congressmen. A letter had been elicited from General Jackson, declaring with his usual vehemence in favor of the project, and urging it upon the ground that Texas was absolutely necessary to us as the most easily defensible frontier against Great Britain. Using the favorite argument of the Southerners of his school, he said, quote, Great Britain has already made treaties with Texas, and we know that far-seeing nation never omits a circumstance in her extensive intercourse with the world which can be turned to account in increasing her military resources. May she not enter into an alliance with Texas, and reserving, as she doubtless will, the northwestern boundary question as the cause of war with us whenever she chooses to declare it, let us suppose that as an ally with Texas we are to fight her. Preparatory to such a movement, she sends her 20,000 or 30,000 men to Texas, organizes them on the Sabine, where supplies and arms can be concentrated before we have even notice of their intentions, makes a lodgment on the Mississippi, excites the Negroes to insurrection, the lower country falls, with it New Orleans, and a servile war rages throughout the whole South and West. Unquote. Footnote. This letter was dated at the Hermitage near Nashville, Tennessee, February 13, 1843, and was printed a year later in the National Intelligencer, with the date altered to 1844. 
These fanciful prophecies of evil were privately circulated for a year among those whom they would be most likely to influence, and the entire letter was printed in 1844, with a result never intended by the writer. It contributed greatly, in the opinion of many, to defeat Van Buren, whom Jackson held in great esteem and regard, and served the purposes of the Tyler faction whom he detested. The argument, based on imaginary British intrigues, was the one most relied upon by Mr. Tyler's successive secretaries of state. John C. Calhoun, in his dispatch of the 12th of August, 1844, instructed our minister in Paris to impress upon the government of France the nefarious character of the English diplomacy which was seeking, by defeating the annexation of Texas, to accomplish the abolition of slavery, first in that region and afterwards throughout the United States. Quote, a blow calamitous to the continent beyond description, end quote. No denials on the part of the British government had any effect. It was a fixed idea of Calhoun and his followers that the designs of Great Britain against American slavery could only be baffled by the annexation of Texas. Van Buren was not in principle opposed to the admission of Texas into the Union at the proper time and with the proper conditions, but the more ardent Democrats of the South were unwilling to listen to any conditions or any suggestion of delay. They succeeded in inducing the convention to adopt the two-thirds rule after a whole day of stormy debate, and the defeat of Van Buren was secured. The nomination of Mr. Polk was received without enthusiasm, and the exultant hopes of the Whigs were correspondingly increased. Contemporary observers differ as to the causes which gradually, as the summer advanced, changed the course of public opinion to such an extent as to bring defeat in November upon a party which was so sure of victory in June. It has been the habit of the anti-slavery Whigs, who have written upon the subject, to ascribe the disaster to an indiscretion of the candidate himself. At the outset of the campaign, Mr. Clay's avowed opinion as to the annexation of Texas was that of the vast majority of his party, especially in the North. While not opposing an increase of territory under all circumstances, he said, in a letter written from Raleigh, North Carolina, two weeks before his nomination, quote, I consider the annexation of Texas at this time without the consent of Mexico as a measure compromising the national character, involving us certainly in war with Mexico, probably with other foreign powers, dangerous to the integrity of the Union, inexpedient in the present financial condition of the country, and not called for by any expression of public opinion. End of quote. He supported these views with temperate and judicious reasons, which were received with much gratification throughout the country. Of course, they were not satisfactory to everyone, and Mr. Clay became so disquieted by letters of inquiry and of criticism from the South that he was at last moved in an unfortunate hour to write another letter to a friend in Alabama, which was regarded as seriously modifying the views he had expressed in the letter from Raleigh. He now said, quote, I have no hesitation in saying that, far from having any personal objections to the annexation of Texas, I should be glad to see it, without dishonor, without war, with the common consent of the Union, and upon fair and just terms. I do not think the subject of slavery ought to affect the question one way or the other, whether Texas be independent or incorporated in the United States. I do not believe it will prolong or shorten the duration of that institution. It is destined to become extinct at some distant day, in my opinion, by the operation of the inevitable laws of population. It would be unwise to refuse a permanent acquisition, which will exist as long as the globe remains, on account of a temporary institution. End of quote. Mr. Clay does not in this letter disclaim or disavow any sentiments previously expressed. He says, as anyone might say, that provided certain impossible conditions were complied with, he would be glad to see Texas in the Union, and that he was so sure of the ultimate extinction of slavery that he would not let any consideration of that transitory system interfere with a great national advantage. It might naturally have been expected that such an expression would have given less offense to the opponents than to the friends of slavery, but the contrary effect resulted and it soon became evident that a grave error of judgment had been committed in writing the letter. The principal opposition to annexation in the North had been made expressly upon the ground that it would increase the area of slavery, 
and the comparative indifferences with which Mr. Clay treated that view of the subject cost him heavily in the canvas. Horace Greeley, who should be regarded as an impartial witness in such a case, says, quote, The Liberty Party, so-called, pushed this view of the matter beyond all justice and reason, insisting that Mr. Clay's antagonism to annexation, not being founded in anti-slavery conviction, was of no account whatever, and that his election should on that ground be opposed. End of quote. It availed nothing that Mr. Clay, alarmed at the defection in the North, wrote a third and final letter reiterating his unaltered objections to any such annexation as was at that time possible. The damage was irretrievable. It was not possible that his letters gained or saved him a vote in the South among the advocates of annexation. They cared for nothing short of their own unconditional scheme of immediate action. They forgot the services rendered by Mr. Clay in bringing about the recognition of Texan independence a few years before. They saw that Mr. Polk was ready to risk everything, war, international complications, even the dishonor of broken obligations, to accomplish their purpose, and nothing the Whig candidate could say would weigh anything in the balance against this blind and reckless readiness. On the other hand, Mr. Clay's cautious and moderate position did him irreparable harm among the ardent opponents of slavery. They were not willing to listen to counsels of caution and moderation. More than a year before, thirteen of the Whig anti-slavery congressmen, headed by the illustrious John Quincy Adams, had issued a fervid address to the people of the free states, declaiming in language of passionate force against the scheme of annexation as fatal to the country, calling it, in fact, identical with dissolution, and saying that, quote, it would be a violation of our national compact, its objects, designs, and the great elementary principles which entered into its formation of a character so deep and fundamental, and would be an attempt to eternize an institution and a power of nature so unjust in themselves, so injurious to the interests and abhorrent to the feelings of the people of the free states, as in our opinion, not only inevitably to result in a dissolution of the Union, but fully to justify it and we not only assert that the people of the free states ought not to submit to it, but we say with confidence that they would not submit to it. End of quote. To men in a temper like that indicated by these words, no arguments drawn from consideration of political expediency could be expected to have any weight, and it was of no use to say to them that in voting for a third candidate they were voting to elect Mr. Polk, the avowed and eager advocate of annexation. If all the votes cast for James G. Burney, the Liberty candidate, had been cast for Clay, he would have been elected, and even as it was, the contest was close and doubtful to the last. Burney received 62,263 votes, and the popular majority of Polk over Clay was only 38,792. There are certain temptations that no government yet instituted has been able to resist. When an object is ardently desired by the majority, when it is practicable, when it is expedient for the material welfare of the country, and when the cost of it will fall upon other people, it may be taken for granted that, in the present condition of international ethics, the partisans of the project will never lack means of defending its morality. The annexation of Texas was one of these cases. Moralists called it an inexcusable national crime, conceived by southern statesmen for the benefit of slavery. Footnote. This purpose was avowed by John C. Calhoun in the Senate, May 23, 1836. See also his speech of February 24, 1847. Carried on during a term of years with unexampled energy, truculence, and treachery in both houses of Congress, in the cabinets of two presidents, in diplomatic dealings with foreign powers, every step of its progress marked by false professions, by broken pledges, by a steady degradation of moral fiber among all those engaged in the scheme. The opposition to it, as usually happens, consisted partly in the natural effort of partisans to baffle their opponents, and partly in an honorable protest of heart and conscience against a great wrong committed in the interest of a national sin. But looking back upon the whole transaction, even over so short a distance as now separates us from it, one cannot but perceive that the attitude of the two parties was in some sort inevitable, and that the result was also sure, whatever the subordinate events or incidents which may have led to it. 
it was impossible to defeat or greatly to delay the annexation of Texas, and although those who opposed it but obeyed the dictates of common morality, they were fighting a battle beyond ordinary human powers. Here was a great empire offering itself to us, a state which had gained its independence and built itself into a certain measure of order and thrift through American valor and enterprise. She offered us a magnificent estate of 376,000 square miles of territory, all of it valuable, and much of it of unsurpassed richness and fertility. Even those portions of it once condemned as desert now contribute to the markets of the world vast stores of wool and cotton, herds of cattle and flocks of sheep. Not only were these material advantages of great attractiveness to the public mind, but many powerful sentimental considerations reinforced the claim of Texas. The Texans were not an alien people. The few inhabitants of that vast realm were mostly Americans, who had occupied and subdued a vacant wilderness. The heroic defense of the Alamo had been made by Travis, Bowie, and David Crockett, whose exploits and death form one of the most brilliant pages of our border history. Fannin and his men, four hundred strong, when they laid down their lives at Goliad, had carried mourning into every southwestern state, and when a few days later Samuel Houston and his eight hundred raw levies defeated and destroyed the Mexican army at San Jacinto, captured Santa Anna, the Mexican president, and with American thrift, instead of giving him the death he merited for his cruel murder of unarmed prisoners, saved him to make a treaty with. The whole people recognized something of kinship in the unaffected valor with which these borderers died, and the humorous shrewdness with which they bargained, and felt as if the victory over the Mexicans were their own. The schemes of the southern statesmen who were working for the extension of slavery were not defensible, and we have no disposition to defend them. But it may be doubted whether there is a government on the face of the earth which under similar circumstances would not have yielded to the same temptation. Under these conditions the annexation sooner or later was inevitable. No man and no party could oppose it except at serious cost. It is not true that schemes of annexation are always popular. Several administrations have lost heavily by proposing them. Grant failed with Santo Domingo, Seward with St. Thomas, and it required all his skill and influence to accomplish the ratification of the Alaska Purchase. There is no general desire among Americans for acquiring outlying territory, however intrinsically valuable it may be. Their land hunger is confined within the limits of that of a western farmer once quoted by Mr. Lincoln, who used to say, I am not greedy about land. I only want what joins mine. Whenever a region contiguous to the United States becomes filled with Americans, it is absolutely certain to come under the American flag. Texas was as sure to be incorporated into the Union as two drops of water touching each other to become one and this consummation would not have been prevented for any length of time if Clay or Van Buren had been elected in 1844. The honorable scruples of the Whigs, the sensitive consciences of the Liberty Men, could never have prevailed permanently against a tendency so natural and so irresistible. Everything that year seemed to work against the Whigs. At a most unfortunate time for them, there was an outbreak of that native fanaticism which reappears from time to time in our politics with the periodicity of malarial fevers, and always to the profit of the party against which its efforts are aimed. It led to great disturbances in several cities, and to riot and bloodshed in Philadelphia. The Clay Party were, of course, free from any complicity with these outrages. But the foreigners, in their alarm, huddled together almost as one man on the side where the majority of them always voted, and this occasioned a heavy loss to the Whigs in several states. The first appearance of Lincoln in the canvas was in a judicious attempt to check this unreasonable panic. At a meeting held in Springfield, June 12th, he introduced and supported resolutions declaring that, quote, the guarantee of the rights of conscience as found in our Constitution is most sacred and inviolable, and one that belongs no less to the Catholic than the Protestant, and that all attempts to abridge or interfere with these rights, either of Catholic or Protestant, directly or indirectly, have our decided disapprobation, and shall have our most effective opposition. End of quote. 
Several times afterwards in his life, Lincoln was forced to confront this same proscriptive spirit among the men with whom he was more or less affiliated politically, and he never failed to denounce it as it deserved, whatever might be the risk of loss involved. Beginning with this manly protest against intolerance and disorder, he went into the work of the campaign and continued in it with unabated ardor to the end. The defeat of Clay affected him, as it did thousands of others, as a great public calamity and a keen personal sorrow. It is impossible to mistake the accent of sincere mourning which we find in the journals of the time. The addresses which were sent to Mr. Clay from every part of the country indicate a depth of affectionate devotion which rarely falls to the lot of a political chieftain. An extract from the one sent by the Clay Clubs of New York will show the earnest attachment and pride with which the young men of that day still declared their loyalty to their beloved leader, even in the midst of irreparable disaster. Quote, we will remember you, Henry Clay, while the memory of the glorious or the sense of the good remains in us, with a grateful and admiring affection which shall strengthen with our strength and shall not decay with our decline. We will remember you in all our future trials and reverses as him whose name honored defeat and gave it a glory which victory could not have brought. We will remember you when patriotic hope rallies again to successful contest with the agencies of corruption and ruin. For we will never know a triumph which you do not share in life, whose glory does not accrue to you in death. End of quote. Footnote. This massacre inspired one of the most remarkable poems of Walt Whitman. Now I tell you what I knew of Texas in my early youth, in which occurs his description of the rangers. They were the glory of the race of rangers, matchless with horse, rifle, song, supper, courtship. Large, turbulent, generous, handsome, proud, and affectionate. Bearded, sunburnt, dressed in the free costume of hunters. Not a single one over thirty years of age. End of section 13